the heat wave. Oh, <laughs> it's 40 in Chicago. Oh, that's okay. Well, the clock has struck 10, so uh, welcome everyone to the uh, sixth ARC vi video meeting. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's joined. We've got a really great turnout today, and we've got a really good uh, slate of presentations to go through. And uh, you, if you can see the, the screen, I've got the, uh, the list of things we're going to cover today. And uh, all the people. Oh, it seems like everybody's here, I think, uh, to do these presentations. So we're in good shape. And uh, so after we do the presentations, we will have a an items for sale, items wanted section. That's number eight on the menu, uh, menu you're looking at in front of you. And then after the uh, items for sale, we'll do an open session. So we're going to try to get through this in uh, as, as quickly as we can. And I just want to briefly go over the, uh, the protocol here. Many of you have already been through some of these meetings, but what we try to do, I think the most important thing if you're participating is stay on mute. That's at the bottom of the screen there. That cuts down on the background noise. Um, and uh, I think uh, what we wanna do here today is uh, uh, try to get through these these presentations uh, in, an, in an hour or so. And if we can't, we can't. But uh, the next meeting is January 16th. And if you got any feedback, there's an email address right there on the screen for you to uh, give us some feedback. And I, I do want to welcome anyone who wants to be a presenter. We've had some good presentations and uh, we continue to have good ones. So join in, be a presenter. So with that being said, I will turn it over to Matt and he will do a brief uh, introduction about Zoom. And there's some key things that not everybody knows that are very helpful. So Matt. I'm going to turn it over to you. And then after that, it will be Bill's presentation. OK. Uh, let me do this. All right, are you guys seeing the Zoom screen? Yes. I mean, sorry, sorry, the, the, the present, not that, the presentation screen. Yes. yes. Okay, great. It's good if the guy who's supposedly telling everybody how to work this actually knows how to work this. It's confusing uh, when you have multiple screens on. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, so I wanted to just do this real short today. Um, so the, the main thing is this meeting controls bar on the bottom, that's where you're mute and unmute controls are, and uh, that's the most important one. Please stay muted unless you want everybody to hear what you're saying. Um, second, under the uh, video option is where, the, if you hit the up and down arrows over here, you have options to change your camera and play with the background and things like that. Uh, and that's this for the microphone and audio controls, and this for the video controls. But really what I wanted to bring everyone's attention to is uh, this feature here in uh, to save the chat. So during our meeting, and especially during the wanted and for sale portion of the meeting, we use the chat feature uh, to conveniently put up information so you don't have to write it all down. So at the end of the meeting, before the meeting closes, if you want to save that to a file, you just, on the chat window, uh, you hit these three dots or ellipses, as we in IT call it for some strange reason, uh, and there will be an option there uh, to save the chats to a file. So that's all I wanted to cover. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, our first presenter of the day is Bill Cohn, and uh, he's he's done his tips and tricks 
uh, presentations before and they're always excellent. And today he's got uh, a new one. So take it away, Bill. All right, you see it? Yeah. Yep. Does it say the dim bulb tester? It does. Good, I got that right. <laughs> uh, okay, um, today we are gonna talk about something called the dim bulb tester. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not, I'm not shy here. I actually stole most of this information uh, from uh, another website called antigradio.org, not to be confused with our website, which has a dash in the middle. This is uh, Phil Nelson's website that he's, he's been writing for the last like 25 years. And so I took a lot of shots out of his because rather than me creating them, he had already done it. So I figured, why should I re reinvent the wheel here? So. So what do I mean by a dim bulb tester? And I realize there's a lot of people on this call who probably already understand this, but uh, suffice to say, there's some people who might wanna, wanna hear why, why we do this. The, the dim bulb tester basically is a way of testing um, unknown functional radios without possibly causing fuses to blow or uh, having, causing damage to uh, uh, critical components within the radio and allow us to bring it up safely. Uh, let me move to the next screen here. There we go. All right, so this is kind of a picture of a, of a typical dim bulb tester. And basically it really consists of a light bulb that gets put in series with the device under test. Device under test being the radio that you're testing. Um, one of the things that when we started using dim bulb testers many, many, many years ago, I know I started using them back in, in the 70s, um, the idea of a dim bulb, light bulbs were incandescent light bulbs. Today, the idea of getting an incandescent light bulb may be a difficult thing to do since incandescent light bulbs are hard to come by these days. Um, but suffice it to say, and thanks to uh, um, uh, Tom Kleinschmidt, he gave me a whole bag full of different wattage light bulbs. Uh, I suggest you save your light bulbs, your incandescent light bulbs, because this does not work with CFLs or with LED bulbs, it requires the use of, a, uh, of an incandescent light bulb, because basically an incandescent light bulb is a resistor of sorts um, in simplest forms. Um, so let's do this. So this is the wiring diagram of a dim bulb tester. So we have a plug that goes in the wall. Um, we have a switch so we can turn the, the test system on. A light bulb socket, which you can procure from the hardware store and a socket so that you can plug the radio in somewhere. All right, so this is your basic setup. The idea here is you can change the light bulb depending on what it is you want to test because that's kind of an important factor here. Uh, next shot. So one of the things you want to note is when you're testing a radio, you really, and you want to use a dim bulb tester to test the radio, you really need to understand how many watts the radio normally draws nominally. Um, this is a, a label off of a Zenith uh, ACDC uh, AM FM radio. These are pretty common. Uh, they, they made these for like, you know, 35 years, the same, same basic circuit. And that particular radio draws about 30 watts, which is typical for, for these AM, AM FM radios. And it's also typical for the uh, uh, five tube ACDC radios as, as well. They're between 25, 30 watts, 35 watts for an ACDC radio. But it's important to understand, you need to understand the device's uh, power draw because that's gonna determine what light bulb you would put into your uh, test set. All right, here's a, a picture of a radio. Uh, in fact, that particular radio has a power transformer as far as I understood. Uh, and, and several light bulbs there. I think there's like a, that looks like about a seven watt, uh, uh, light bulb from a from a uh, series or from a string of uh, uh, Christmas lights and possibly a, a 40 or, or 60 watt bulb and it looks like the other one looks like a 100 watt or 150 watt light bulb. Um, the next shot shows what would happen if we used a that seven watt light bulb in series with this radio. This radio and probably because it's an older radio probably doesn't draw 30 watts. I bet it's closer to probably about a, a 60 watt radio. Well, when you turn it on, because the radio wants to, wants to take in 60 watts, the dim bulb using only a seven watt bulb lights up brightly because it, it's absorbing all of the power here. 
So that's the wrong light bulb to use when testing a radio that draws that much power. What you really wanna do is you wanna select a light bulb that's about one and a half to two times the um, wattage of the radio that you're testing. So if you're looking at a 30 watt radio, a 40 to 60 watt bulb is the right bulb to put in there. So in this case, uh, this is about a 60 watt bulb. I'm guessing this radio probably draws something about 45 to 50 watts, that particular one. And you'll notice it truly lights up dim. The typical way you're gonna see a radio work, uh, especially ones with don't have, uh, don't have uh, um, uh, a, a, if they have a, 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 a tube rectifier, they'll light up brightly initially as the tubes then start to glow in the radio, uh, it'll dim down and then it'll brighten up again as the rectifier starts to conduct. Now what the dim bulb does for you here though, is if the unit has a short someplace in the B plus supply, when it comes back on again, normally it would come back on at some dim level and the radio may even start to play. Most radios will play if you pick the right light bulb. If there was a short in the B plus line or you have a failing electrolytic or the electrolytic capacitors are trying to reform, the light bulb will start to come on very brightly. And as the, as the uh, capacitors form, it may start to dim back down again. Uh, that may or may not happen. But it, it, in the case here, is we're not gonna ruin a power transformer. We're not gonna ruin a, um, a, a field coil uh, speaker, we don't want to draw too much current through the field coil, um, or we don't want to blow out another rectifier tube. So the, that, that dim bulb will protect us against that. It'll also protect us if we plug in something with a really bad power cord that has shorts in it because it'll just light up the bulb. So as you can see, you can use the bulb as a, a way of telling whether or not the radio is starting to come back. Oops, I want to do that, I'm do that. So now I've had, talks with several people from the club here and they say, well, I use a Variac and I don't really use a Dimbo. Okay, you can do that. Uh, my recommendation is then you have some, some sort of a means of monitoring what the radio is gonna draw. This is something that's a little more modern and actually is really inexpensive. Everybody in the radio hobby ought to buy one of these kilowatt devices. I think they're available on Amazon for maybe 15 to $20. They're not very expensive. They will measure the, the, the wattage, you know, essentially the, the power consumption of a device under test. They'll measure the voltage of the incoming, incoming from the, the line. It'll measure the power frequency. Not that's terribly important when you're plugging things in the wall here because it should be 60 Hertz. Could be interesting though, if you're trying to plug something into a power generator. Uh, but, you know, I'm, that's another use. It'll also tell, tell you the uh, current draws as an amp button on it as well. So this device is actually really interesting when you tie it with a, um, a Variac, because it'll start to tell you as the current comes up and goes down in the radio. And you can generally tell if a radio has got a real failure if it tries to draw way more current than it's supposed to. If it's supposed to draw 30 watts and it's drawing, drawing 50 watts, you know you got a problem in the radio. So this is a an interesting piece of test equipment that I suggest most people own. One caveat is if you're using this af in, after a Variac, when the Variac is turned down fairly low, the kilowatt meter doesn't particularly work very well. I think much below 60 volts uh, because obviously it needs power to run it. And if it doesn't see enough voltage, it won't run properly. So that's, that's a piece of consideration uh, that, that is necessary to understand when using something like this. But I highly recommend that everybody own, a, own one of these devices. It's, it's just self-contained and it kind of does it all in one little box without you having to string together a bunch of multimeters to make these measurements. It's just kind of all encompassing. Um, I'm gonna make this very short and sweet here. If there are any questions, we can discuss this. I'm open. Silence. <laughs> Is that diagram that you showed about the second or third slot on that antique rea, that one. Yeah, is it, that yes, on it the, actually is on, on, if you Google um, dim bulb tester, the first thing that came up in my Google search was this website. And he has a, he has a really good, you know, two page discussion that shows a picture of this. I mean, I could draw on this schematically, but this is, it's really simple. So yeah, I, I would suggest, you know, it, it's, it's a good piece of reference. If you haven't done this before, 
I highly recommend that you own one of these things. <laughs> you can take a picture of it if you like. Not a problem. Fairly easy to deal with. Okay, Bill, just for confirm for everybody, if you have a radio that is not behaving, that bulb is going to be almost at full brightness, right? That's correct. If, if there's a short in the radio, the, the bulb will come on at, at a much higher brightness. So basically, the bulb becomes your watt meter. The brighter the bulb, more wattage going, more, more watts are being consumed by the device under test. So, and, and as you get more experience with radios, uh, you get a feel for, for what, what, you know, what the bulb should be. It's certainly going to be different uh, if you're looking at like a console radio, like, you know, like a 12 tube Zenith console radio is going to draw like 180 watts. You need a much bigger light bulb if you're trying to test that. Or if you're, or if you're doing television sets, you need a, a much a larger light bulb to work with television sets. I don't know if too many people here do TV sets, but suffice it to say, that's why you need to understand how much how much uh, current or how much uh, power your the device under test is testing. Uh, this works real well, obviously, for little small AC-DC radios. Uh, little battery sets, um, the AC-DC battery sets that have one volt tubes in them draw very little power. Uh, they typically only are like 15 watt devices. So understand that a 60 watt bulb in there is gonna protect it very much. You need to start with a much smaller light bulb. So you need to have an array of light bulbs that you're gonna use in here. Uh, it, this is like switching the, uh, the switching the um, uh, current or, or the range selector on your VOM. You need different light bulbs to do different tests. So I, I suggest you kind of have an array of light bulbs. So, you know, save up your light bulbs. Uh, this particular test set obviously can be built um, on, a, on a wooden board if you want to do it that way. And you can screw the, you know, you can get these parts from Home Depot or if you're in the Midwest, you can go to Menards as Matt would do, uh, or, or, or you can go to Lowe's, uh, Lowe's are available too, or whatever local Ace Hardware or, or whatever is nearby. So this is this is something that's easy to put together and, and probably something you should. Well, Bill, the, the, that's great. I actually just built one and uh, I, I built it in a quad box. So it all fit together. You just mm -hmm. got a basic quad box that all got in there. And I actually had a question and uh, you know, I was wondering because I, I just used it on radio and I wasn't getting the right bulb. I didn't know if I was doing it right. So thank you very much for the, uh, the wattage information and the light bulb information that, that really helped. The quad box is a great idea because you get a quad box, you often get a, 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 bulb, you know, a, a bulb socket that goes into- That's a what I did. That's exactly what I did. Yeah, and you could build it all in one, in one box. And yeah, that, that works out really well. So yeah. The other That's thing I mentioned- Thank you very much. Everybody should have everybody should have an isolation transform when you're working on hot chassis radios. That yeah, goes in front of everything. All right. Okay. Let's That's it. let's uh, I will wrap that up if we can. Share. I will unshare here. I got a comment. Yeah. What I ended up doing is I have uh, four sockets, and then I put a uh, switch across the socket, and then I have four bulbs, and I can select what bulb I want to put in line. And the reason That's I did idea. that. That's a great idea. The reason, I, the reason yeah. I did that is, you know, okay, you got a shoebox full of bulbs. Well, I broke a few bulbs just from being knocked around. So I rebuilt the tester and put four sockets up there. That's hanging on a wall. It's got four bulbs. I got four switches and I can click in whatever bulb I want. Okay, well, that's a great suggestion, Keith. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Uh, Steve Muckow is up with his uh, JW Miller radio, the Transistall. Okay. You ready to go? Yeah, we're all set. Okay, let's go. Can you guys hear me all right here? Yeah, yeah, we can okay. hear you fine. Before I get into the formal presentation, I just want to show you uh, uh, the actual radio I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this is made by the J.W. Miller Company, the same company that makes the coils and so forth. Um, I'm going to get into a more detailed explanation of the radios, but I wanted to just kind of show you, <laughs> you can see here, uh, there, it's kind of, the aspect ratio is kind of, kind of hard to see the distance here, but uh, not, not too large, my hand here. Uh, I'll turn one on here just to let you hear that it actually is still working. And it's time they got a little update. Degrees and air under cloudy skies, 40 in Midway Lakefront, 39 so, uh, degrees, and in Wilmington, cloudy, 39. 
very simple set, um, three transistors, but I'll get into the, uh, uh, the more formal presentation. Let me see if I can start this thing. Okay, you got that up there? Not yet. Not there yet? Okay, hang on a second. Uh, da -da -da. Let's see here. So share your screen button in the middle on the bottom and then yeah. select the screen, then click share again. Okay, it's there it is. All right, how's that? There it's coming up. Okay. We see it. Now let's do this. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, basically, I just want to kind of give you a background on this. Um, I'm not a transistor radio collector, really. But uh, these sets were both purchased by my dad back in 1957. He was building radios forever since he was a boy. And uh, of course, around that time, the mid 50s is when the transistor was kind of coming into its own. Um, and he, he bought these from uh, Grove Electronics here in Chicago. Some of you may remember that uh, were around back, back then. Um, and of course, at, at the time, there were still a lot of tube radios out there. Um, so let me just uh, go ahead and continue on here. Uh, J.W. Miller uh, basically began in 1924, uh, mainly supplying coils, transformers. That's what we know them for, I think, mainly us experimenters located in LA. They became part of Bell Industries, probably distributor. They were acquired by Bournes in 2006 and the uh, products continue to be available today. If you look in the Allied catalog or a Miller catalog, it's amazing how many coils are in there. Uh, just incredible. So they were definitely a big player and, and probably still are. These are what we think of basically when we think of Miller, I think, at least I do uh, in experimenting. We just don't generally associate Miller with radios. Um, however, they, uh, you know, back in the, in the 40s, 50s, in an effort to increase their coil sales, they came out with these data sheets or plans on how to build radios. And of course, they would build the radios around the coils or have you build them around the coils. And they actually, in some cases, would offer uh, pre-punched chassis and they would offer variable capacitors and uh, fixed capacitors. In other words, non-coil items that you might need to, uh, to do that, to, to do that build. Um, they would put these data sheets out in the stores uh, for free. People would just, just come in and get the sheet. And of course, that would prompt them to get interested and perhaps order some, uh, some, some parts. Um, again, back in the 40s, late 40s, 50s, uh, hi-fi was a, was a big deal. And they came out with their first uh, TRF AM tuner, 585, basically just a crystal set. But uh, you can kind of you can kind of see back here, and there are coils, transformers. So again, it was a way to to utilize the coils. Uh, so they jumped into the hi-fi, the hi-fi era there with both feet. This is the one I think we're probably most familiar with when you talk about a Miller. Uh, radio. This is a tuner, actually. Uh, 565. It was a kit introduced in 56. Uh, it was basically a very expensive crystal set, but the coils were designed uh, especially to give you very good fidelity and low interference, low adjacent uh, channel interference. Obviously, the stronger the station, the better the signal to noise and it would connect directly to a hi-fi amp input. And if you guys have ever tried taking a crystal set and just taking the output and going into a, into a hi-fi amp, it's amazing the fidelity. I mean, it, it's clear that the, uh, 
that the restriction and fidelity is the receiver and not the transmitter. It's kind of tough nowadays. There aren't many music stations down there to, uh, to try that with, but uh, you can still get an appreciation if you were to do that. But it boasted a full audio range. And uh, again, it was just a crystal set, basically. No power, uh, no batteries, whatever. This is a close-up view of that particular set. This is the same size as the transistor, uh, same cabinet, but uh, circuitry is quite a bit different. And this is the transistor then, um, the subject of today's presentation. It's three transistors brought out in uh, 1957. Notice there are two Conrad triangles on the dial there. Uh, Conrad was implemented, implemented in 1951 I think it went from 51 through the early 60s, um, kind of a Cold War um, response. Uh, there are not many three transistor radios that were sold. Uh, most transistor radios were in the you know, five, six, seven transistor category. There were some two transistor radios called boys radios uh, and they were brought out because uh, there was no import tax on a toy and they were considered toys. Uh, but to get that performance out of a two transistor radio, they had to uh, put some very clever uh, uh, circuitry in there. Mainly the reflex is, is what they used uh, where you use one stage uh, for two purposes, one RF and, and one audio. So one transistor could perform amplification in two ranges depending on uh, the, the coils you used in the, in the stage. This also used a, a reflex stage in here too. So this, these are some of the features of the radio. Uh, again, it was introduced in 57, just a year after the crystal set we talked about. Uh, three transistors and two diodes, uh, one, N, one N34 or similar, uh, same size as the previous Miller radio. It has a reflex IF stage, so they, they fed IF signal energy in there as well as audio. Uh, standard PM speaker, 25 milliwatts of audio, single, a single output transistor, but uh, that was pretty adequate actually. They used a Miller loop stick and three Miller coils, so there they got to use up some of their, some of their coil stock. Uh, came in various colors, black, ivory, red, blue, and gray. 9 volt battery, which lasted six months, as they claimed, to vernier control, which uh, it is, and it's very nice, and it still works well today after uh, about 60 years or something. This was $29, which is about $270 today. Um, it's a pretty rare radio. Um, I don't know of many out there at all. Uh, it's, there's a possibility that it was actually never really sold in, in, into, the, uh, into the marketplace fully. They kind of introduced it, but they may have pulled back and, uh, and stopped the production early. In the rear view, it's a single PC board. You can see the long, large loop stick on top. The components are not at all miniaturized. It's almost like a, like a tube radio in terms of transformers, capacitors, pot, and whatever. So it's, it's using conventional this is all before I think the, uh, the miniaturization craze took over. This is from the uh, from the manual. My dad built one of these, and I built one of these. So we, uh, I was about 12 years old at the time. Uh, we had these in the in the museum in Elgin on display, and then they were in uh, at Radio Fest uh, 2018, I believe, in the uh, in the display uh, room. Here's the schematic. <clears throat> you can see uh, the transistors one, two, and three. And uh, one diode was used for the detector right here. And this is the, uh, the reflex stage. And then one diode was used as a kind of a, of a rough AGC where you change the signal or the impedance um, at this point here single transistor uh, output for the, uh, the audio, pretty straightforward. 
there was only one known advertisement for this radio, and that was in Popular Electronics one month in September of 57. They did have a couple of flyers that they had made, um, but I, I don't have a, co a copy of, of those. Just some closing thoughts on this. The instructions were good and the kit assembly was uneventful, as I recall. The burn to your action is smooth, it still is today. Um, it isn't a great performing radio, but it's, it's adequate for local stations. I guess when you have three transistors, you can't expect too much. Uh, but obviously on local 50 KW stations or something, it's, uh, it's plenty adequate. Uh, the, the plastic is okay, doing well, the color is fine. Um, as I say, likely very few are sold. From what I've been able to determine so far, they had in the stores a display. And a lot of these radios were put on display for possible future sales. And some people purchased the display items. And so I don't think there are too many of them out there. Um, and of course, at the time, too, in 57, Japan was starting to enter the market with their radios. This was a kit for a uh, you know, $270 equivalent price today. So very expensive. And I think uh, it's also kind of a table radio. And uh, you know, for table radios, back in the 50s, miniaturization and portability was a big deal. People were going for the, uh, the radios with handles or shirt pocket, very portable. This is a table with a battery. Why would you have a battery in a, uh, in a location that's not going to be a portable uh, requirement? So I think th th there were too many negatives against this radio when it came out, and I think it just finally uh, faded. So that's really all I have. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, i uh, be glad to answer them. Does that pack of cigarettes come with the radio? <laughs> hey, Good question. Do you still have these uh, radios? Yeah, I've got, I've got, uh, you know, I'll, I'll close this out here. Yeah, that's great. So I've got, uh, I've got two of them here. This is the, uh, this is the red one. Yeah. Come back. And uh, it's got a gold gold front. Um, it's a metal front. And again, a vernier dial. It's it's uh, very nice. And the, the black one is here. They're in beautiful condition too. Yeah, they really they really are. They were used uh, just about every day. You have know. you tried to uh, get other colors? I have not. You know, it, it, it's it's even it's even tough to find information on them because I think they were just. Pulled out of the market so quickly. Okay. Okay. Let's. We're going to have to uh, move along here, Steve. But that was an excellent presentation. That's, that's fascinating stuff, and the fact that it ties into your own personal uh, history is uh, is pretty cool. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah. Presentation. Okay. okay. So um, Matt, did you want to throw that poll question out really quickly here before we move on to David Proof? I do. So you'll see a poll question on the screen. Uh, the, uh, this is the first of two very quickly. Uh, do you want to list something that you're looking for or wanted today at near the end of the meeting, or do you want to sell something? Let's give that uh, 10 more seconds. Got to be quick here. Got to be quick. <laughs> I see everybody looking for those buttons. <laughs> okay. So we have five people that are, we have five people that are interested in uh, selling or wanting. And second question, whoops. Second question is, um, we're always looking for uh, new presenters, or I should really say additional presentations. Um, past presenters are more than welcome to present again. 
So this question is, uh, do you want to give a informal talk or prepared presentation? And if so, when? So we'll give this. Um, 15, 20 seconds here. Is there a no one here or is it informal talk when you just want to come in every now and then? Oh, there's a just, I think there's a no, just say no. <laughs> Where? I don't see, I don't see no anywhere. Well, just don't click on anything. Okay, I can't hit submit then. Well, then blow it off. <laughs> All right, Tom. <laughs> Rudy, I'm trying to force you to present. <laughs> I'll have to look at that poll if there's no, there's okay. no, no. Okay, um, I'll leave this up for, uh, for a minute. Tom, if you just want to go ahead into the next one. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, our next presenter, David Crew, who has presented uh, before. A couple of meetings ago, and uh, he's with the New England Club. And today he's got uh, a topic about uh, the All American Five and the challenge of resistor cord replacement. David, are you ready to go? I I am ready. I'm. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Well, th 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 thanks, guys, uh, and uh, great stuff so far. Really, um, I, I I love hearing about people's. It's such an interesting hobby we've got, and there's so many little niches, and uh, I just love it when people share their experiences and their expertise. Uh, this, thank you again for having me with another story from my shop, and this is um, this is my glorious shop filled. This is me working on an, an RCA 5T at the time. Uh, you can see my signal generator, my frequency counter, which is about the most modern thing I've got in my shop. Everything else um, is pretty much, um, let's call it rustic, along with some of the radios. So what we're going to be talking about today, guys, uh, is a certain All-American 5 radio. Uh, I'm telling you stuff that I know most of you probably know, but the classic old floor model radios these beautiful beasts, they had those big transformers. And they not only made the radios extremely heavy, but they also made it safe for us because they isolated the AC from the chassis. And then, of course, uh, uh, with the little feeds for the filaments and uh, for other uh, circuitry. And then, of course, uh, as the late 30s and the uh, 40s after the war, designers figured out a way to make radios a lot cheaper, which was to eliminate that power transformer and use the filaments in each of the tubes to drop the incoming voltage. So we all know those filaments were in series and that first number in the tube usually indicated the voltage drop. So in this case, we have Let's do the math very quickly, uh, about 117 volts. But here's the thing that we also, and some of us learned the hard way, what happened to the ground? The ground was attached directly to one side of the AC. And so if you reached around the radio when the radio was turned on, yep, you, you got a little bit of a shock. And by the way, if you, incorrectly installed or reinstall the power switch, it meant that that ground was almost always hot. And so more uh, singes to your fingertips ensued. So to mitigate that, some manufacturers began adding some circuitry, a capacitor and a resistor. Sometimes they added an inductor to uh, raise the chassis, excuse me, raise the B minus up from the chassis. And so with that, with that modification, although it didn't completely eliminate the chance to get a zap, um, it, did, um, it did make the radios just a bit safer. The radio we're gonna talk about today is the Emerson 409. Now it's got a couple of interesting features about it. Uh, the first thing, which is, that it really only has four tubes. And these are the four tubes inside the radio. Let's take a quick look at the circuitry. 
which um, oh because uh, okay so it's a I'm sorry uh, the tube numbers were supposed to magically pop up. The problem with this radio is that the three tubes other than the rectifier, <clears throat> actually all the tube, uh, there we go, there's the tube numbers, the 78, the 6F7, the 38, and the 1-V rectifier. Well, um, they only drop 6.3 volts a piece. So when we do that math, we only get about 25 volts. And if we subtract that from the incoming AC line voltage, and by the way, that's modern AC line voltage. I'll talk about that in a second. You got about 95 volts. Because we're running, drawing about 300 mils, that means there's 30 watts that has to be dropped someplace in order for the radio to function. And you notice that resistor up here uh, in the circuit. Well, that resistor actually represents the resistor line cord. Now, in theory, and don't you love it when guys start off a sentence with the words, in theory, this should work. It's not a terrible idea, I guess. If you got 30 watts that you gotta dissipate, why not spread it out over six feet of this resistor line cord, safely letting the heat dissipate over uh, uh, that long space? Well, here's the apocryphal story. The radio gets plugged in and the power cord gets stretched out to its right length. Mrs. Homemaker in the 19, late 1930s, she sees the power cord gets disgusted because it's in front of her furniture and she bundles it up and she sticks it behind the curtain. And that means all that 30 watts is constricted together. And what happens? The curtain bursts into flames. Hence the name curtain burner. Now guys, I did a lot of research. Um, I have uh, uh, a version, a kind of Nexus Lexus newspaper search. I couldn't find, not only could I not find an article about any uh, deaths or any injuries, but I, I could not find any articles about a fire that had actually started from one of these curtain burners. But the legend persisted. And let's face it, it really isn't that bright an idea for those of us in the 20s, 20, in the 2000s, to take an 80 to almost 90 year old radio with one of these dilapidated power cords and try to go back to that technology. There's gotta be a better and safer way to do it. And it turns out there are four things you could do. Now we're right away gonna say, mm -mm, not gonna do that new, old, even a new old stock resistor cord. I, I just don't wanna go there. Um, it, it's, it's a historical artifact, shall we say. So. Let's look at some of the ways that we can replace that resistor line cord. Now, I cannot take credit for these ideas. I did my research online. I, last presentation, I talked about you know, uh, some Facebook groups and of course, uh, uh, Antique Radio Forum. And I found these two sites. One is this fellow, uh, Greg Farmer, who has a terrific article. Um, Actually, not too far from you guys, he's up in Minnesota. He's, um, he describes step-by-step step, uh, how to replace those resistance line cords. And then there's this, this uh, a British fellow, Paul Stenning, who took us through a calculation of the, four, the three different methods for replacing that resistor line cord. One was the single resistor. Now, it's easy right? Because it's an easy calculation. We've, we've kind of already done it. It's easy to install. The problem is you're dissipating 30 watts power in one resistor. And that's a lot of heat. You could use a diode, which drops the, the uh, cycle by half, and that reduces the size of the resistor, but it's still producing a lot of heat. The preferred method, the one that kind of straddles that line between its relatively easy to do, but it also makes it safe and reduces the amount of heat being dissipated is using a capacitive dropper. 
it needs a few other extra components which require a bit of math. I hate math. I, <laughs> I have a degree in engineering, but I barely squeaked by some of these courses that required all this math. As it turns out, my best friend, uh, Paul Stenning, created a spreadsheet, which all you got to do is enter in the values of the radio that you have and bless his pointy little head, the radio that he chose for an example was the Emerson 409. So he had done all the work for me. So looking at the three options, there's your dropper resistor, a 300 ohm resistor, but it's gotta be a 30 watt resistor. We're not gonna go that route. There's the diode, which again, you know, you drop your power around half, but 18 watts, that's still, that's still a lot of heat. Here's the dropper capacitor circuitry, which requires a surge limiter resistor of about 33 ohms, but it only needs a three watt resistor. And there's your discharge resistor of 100K, about one watt. Again, not a lot of heat to be dissipated. Here's the fact, actual circuit. Uh, remember, you'll need three lines because you're still feeding AC directly into the plate of the rectifier. So now the question is, where do you put all these components? And then we come to the great debate. And I think it will be fun sometime to do a forum with everybody kind of chiming in. Because I know some of you guys are capacitor stuffers. You like when you open up the radio to actually look underneath and see the original components. However, you've stuffed them with new uh, components. Um, you know, that's, a, and you know, especially with some of these big uh, power supply cans that sit on top of the chassis, you still want people to look inside and you want to see the original components. And I totally get that. Um, one of the solutions presented for this capacitor dropper circuit was actually stuffing everything into the, um, to one of the sockets uh, in the radio. And you can see there's your complete capacitive dropper circuit. Um, here's what I opted for. Uh, we're all familiar with the wall wart. Uh, they're ubiquitous around our households and uh, all of my fellow hams know the frustrations of the noise that these damn things generate, especially on uh, some of the lower bands. What I decided to do was to stuff it all inside one of these wall warts. I wanted, even though we're only talking a couple of watts, I just, I didn't want to be stuffing all this stuff inside the radio. And I just you know, put it into the wall wart and uh, you can see there's the circuit. And once the wall wart is, and that now I'm going to, hi guys, I'm gonna turn on my video. Whoop. There you go, 850 WEEI in Boston, the sports radio station, with the exception of a couple of other, uh, maybe there's a couple of great music stations here in Boston, uh, but not a lot else to listen to on the AM band. But there you go. There's my solution for your uh, resistor line cord. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great, David. That's an oh. excellent Oh, I love a round of applause. Very nice, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. No, that's cool. I, I especially like how you uh, repurpose the wall work. That's uh, that's really cool, and uh, that's that's a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yes, does, sir. Does it make any difference what side of the AC plug you tap in the third line to? Uh, yeah, it does because one side, oh, I'd have to go back in the deck. Um, yes, because of which side is closer to ground. So, um, 
I don't have the circuit in front of me, so but it does. You got to just, you know, uh, there's a there's the hot and the hotter side. So you want that hotter side further away from ground. I have a second question. Yes, sir. Hi, Matt. Uh, hi. Uh, how hot does the wall wart get with what was it three watts dissipating inside? Barely any. And in fact, I'm gonna now. I've just turned the radio off, so I'm gonna unplug the wall wart and. And it's even got a couple little um, air holes in it, air slots in it. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's not warm at all. It's, it's brilliant. I love it. So that's at the end, that's the radio is actually wired into that? Yep. Yep. I tried, well, I mean. Based on your bewildered look, he, what he did is he took the wall wart apart and put new guts in it. Oh yeah. Well, then I figured. So, okay. the, so the, instead of a standard plug at the end of the radio line, AC line, it's a wall wart plug. Yes, and it to to um, I'm sorry. I think I don't know who asked the question. The this particular wall wart. The reason I chose it is if I can figure out how to show this. Um, we do have polarized uh, pins here. Pins. Um, prongs so the larger prong here which is the ground side uh goes to the so th this side the thinner one goes is the part that goes directly to the plate of the rectifier okay so the the cord that runs into the radio then is a three-line cord three lines yes that's why what i did was i i have a spool of um the cloth wire cover inside here are three wires. Okay. Should have made that clear. Thank you. You thought about it. I look uh, that confused. Uh, what was that question about the fuse? I <laughs> know I asked Tom if I looked that confused. Oh. <laughs> yeah, your body language betrayed you. <laughs> oh, speaking <laughs> of fuses, there is um, one thing I did not include in my schematic because I didn't want it to be too busy, uh, is a fuse. Just, I'm built suspenders and, you know, I don't want to burn my house down. That's a great idea. There was another question. I was just going to ask uh, David if he thought about just uh, laying out a circuit board and using one of the poly case uh, adapters. They're like two bucks. You have the three wire, you know, and... yeah. Because so it sounds like it could be universal that if you stuff different components in there. Mm-hmm. It's the only resistor line cord radio I have. Everything else in my collection here is, um, although, you know, you know, now you got me thinking. Thank you so much because uh, I do have a number of all American fives. So, you know, the idea of, of making them a little safer, I suppose. But yeah. Yeah, yeah the circuit boards, I'm, I'm a circuit board layout kind of guy. Yeah. So I can get, if you have thoughts on it, uh, yeah, I can get boards like for next to nothing. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not interested in, in being a vendor, but the, you know, as I it it was a one shot. So yeah, no, I was thinking for guys at the club, we could you know we could mm. it might be nice to make them available uh, for everybody who would want them. Yeah, uh, you know, they're two bucks. You know, yeah, we could we could talk more about that in the open chat if if we have time later. So that's a sure. great great thought. So. Um, so I'd like to thank you, David, for that excellent presentation. And now we're going to move thank on you. to uh, the next one, uh, which is uh, Charlie Wright's Radiola Collection. So uh, Charlie worked uh, very diligently with Matt to present, uh, create this presentation in PowerPoint. And so here we go. You ready to go, Charlie? Yeah, I think so. Uh, quickly, before I start, just so everybody knows, I'm uh, mostly collect 1920s radios, which include all the battery sets and a few AC sets, my favorite brand being RCA Radiola. So that's the ones I want to show today. And although Radiola has a number of um, in my, is my screen sharing yet? Not sharing yet. 
Oh, there you go. Okay, now let me get the right view here. Am I up? Yes. Looking good? Okay, so actually today I'm going to go about 1920 to 1927 because I didn't have time to do the AC radios. So uh, this is my dealer sign here, which uh, was in front of all the radio dealer dealerships back in the early 20s. Um, uh, I want to emphasize uh, these first these six items that are first done by radio and mass produced radios. It's not that they developed or invented these six items, but they were the first ones to use them in mass production. Mm -hmm. uh, the radio the trade name was used from 1920 to 1930 and somewhat after that until radio went or radio, RCA went to the RCA Victor uh, icon with uh, Nipper, which we're all familiar with, I believe. Um, all my data for this is not in my head, it's in this book, <laughs> which is uh, a fantastic uh, volume on early radio and radio. Hello. I would recommend it to anybody who would like to learn a little more about this. Um, so now uh, I want to quickly, in case some of you aren't familiar with the battery tubes, these are the three tubes we're going to be talking about today. There are four pin triodes. Um, then a little later, there were some four pin amplifiers when they got into using speakers. And these are uh, later tubes that I am not discussing today because they're AC radios. Um, this thing all started with KDKA, which has been mentioned on this, uh, on this forum before. Um, what's important to know about this broadcast is that the reason for it was to launch radio radio into the home. And they, there was a commitment by RC, by uh, radio, uh, Westinghouse to immediately after this broadcast to start broadcasting regular programs, which they had real announcers, they played music, sports news, and religious programs. And they also mass produced radios for the public. And if you look at this red arrow here, you see this radio right here. That is in fact, the first mass produced radio for the home. And you see it right here. Now it started with two items. There was an RA tuner and a DA detector amplifier which the engineers quickly realized would best be served to the public to put it in one case, and they called it the RC. Uh, used uh, 201A2 OA tubes, three of them. The problem with this set is it cost $125, which in 1920, that would equate to $3,250 today. So that'd be kind of like saying how many of you want to buy a 3D TV for $3,000. Um, you know, and not very many hands would go up. So uh, plus you had used headphones, so it wasn't very conducive to a night of entertainment at home. But even so, they sold 145,000 of these sets. And they're readily available on the market today because of that quantity. Uh, but they quickly realized they had to have a cheaper set to get into all the homes. So they came up with this little crystal radio for 25 bucks, uh, which, by the way, is the first radio I ever had in my collection. That's it right there. Um, there are about 25,000 of those made. And around the same time, they came up with this little uh, 
where Judge Green sat. Uh, same case, also rather cheap. And about this time, uh, RCA became the distributor for Westinghouse GE and Rila Specialty. So more or less, they formed this huge organization, RCA being the distributor and these three uh, manufacturers churning out all these radios in their factories. Um, about 1922, Radio came out with their first horn speakers. So quickly they come up with this little amplifier to use with the AC so that, uh, or with the serial signal so that you could use a loudspeaker. Uh, and GE added this little guy to the radio group uh, in 1922, minus the watermark. <laughs> uh, fairly rare radio and mine's not the best. Um, now then, you know, the women folk in the houses did not like these ugly radios in their houses. So Westinghouse decided they, they needed to make a pretty radio. So they combined their new horn speaker into this, into what they called the radiola, the areola grain. And this set was so lousy and worked so poorly that they recalled all of them and replaced them with the radiola grain. Well, the areola grain is therefore was totally destroyed. There's only four or five known to exist in the country at this time. Uh, used four WD-11 tubes. Uh, now, 1923, things are really off and running. Uh, numerous manufacturers, Atwater, Kent, Crosley, and many others, are now starting to produce radios and getting in on the money. But RCA has got a big jump on things, and they've got 20 different sets offered in 1923. They've got two page ads like this in every newspaper and magazine in the country. And they have set up these 15,000 dealers. And they all had a sign like the one I showed you earlier. And so you could go to this dealer, buy one of 20 different radios, and get all your stuff, your batteries, your tubes, your antenna kits and they buy some out and hook it all up. So things are really on the roll. So uh, 1922, they come up with the Radio Lab 2. It's a portable set, except it did not have a speaker. Um, next, they come up with the Radio Lab 4. They didn't necessarily follow these the, num the numbering so I'm not skipping radios, they're just not in order the way they manufactured it. So this was the very first set that I'm aware of that was self-contained. It had the radio, the speaker, the batteries, all included in one box. And it was a pretty popular set. Um, the GE came out with this addition to the radio line, the radio five. Uh, this was the first attempt to make metal look like wood. And they didn't do too bad a job because these are metal cabinets. They had a wood top and a wood bottom. And there was a crystal receiver and a detector amplifier. And then the radio six. It's supposed to have the bottom panel as well, but mine's missing. And it had a detector amplifier with our amplifier combination. Um, this was uh, not a very common set, even though it was made to be used with an indoor loop antenna. Uh, so not many of these were sold and they're fairly rare today. Uh, the RS was an attempt to combine an amplifier with the radio senior in one capital. 
and that didn't pan out real well, as you can see, not too many. So, um, this little guy is, I don't know why they call it special, it's in a little metal cabinet, not too pretty by any means, um, one tube region set. And uh, enterprising manufacturer decided to make an amplifier to run a speaker, but they forgot to put their name on it, so no one knows who made it. Uh, now we're getting into wireless specialties first addition to the radio line, but it was a really not a very good set. It, it performed very poorly, so there were only a small amount made, and this is the scarcest radio. It is very, very hard to find. Uh, so then I went back to the drawing boards and decided to fix their problems with, uh, with the 7, called the 7B. They put it in this really pretty cabinet with a building speaker, so all the women folks said, you can put that right in the living room, right in the middle of the living room. And probably because of the cost, still not too many were made. So it again is a very scarce set today. Now, we go back now to the radio at 3, which uh, Westinghouse decided, you know, there's all these snooty sets out that we still need to come up with cheap ones for most people. <laughs> So they came out with the radio at three, which is this one right here. Two tube regenerative set. A little later, they come up with an amplifier to drive a loudspeaker, a horn speaker, by the way. Then the engineer said, hey, let's do that same thing we did with the, RC, with the early radio and put both of these in one cabinet. So it became the radio at 3A. This was the most popular radio uh, made, almost half a million. So this set is very common on the open market today. Uh, they capitalized on the popularity by making a high-end set with the 3A in a cabinet and a speaker. Okay, the, the Regenoflex was a regenerative, a regenerative set. Uh, we're getting now to where the batteries are smaller and they're making these doors on the radios to put the, radio, the batteries inside so that they're not sitting in the middle of the living room. Um, this is the one I don't have. I, it's the only radio I don't have. It's what they call a phono panel. And it was a little flat radio meant to be mounted in the a Victrola, either where the records were stored or in the lid. And there were a number of manufacturers that made these photo panel sets. Uh, but I don't have one. Uh, now the radio uh, 10, you might notice this is the same panel as the radio Regenoflex. They took the same chassis, put it in a bigger cabinet with a speaker. And they did, this was done fairly frequently back then. In fact, it's fairly done today. Um, now we're getting into a whole new thing here with the super headsets. And this is the first mass produced super headset. Uh, GE manufactured it. It was extremely well received and popular. 164,000 sold. And this was an attempt that we see today of hiding circuitry in sealed containers. They had what they called a catacomb, which was a metal box filled with wax and soldered shut. It had this secret region circuitry hidden inside. Um, one unique thing about this radio, it had these little white discs that you could put in to mark your stations, and then you could replace those at will. So this was selling so well, they started putting them in uh, phonographs. Like you see this one here, they changed the layout a little, but it's the same radio. And then they really get crazy with us. They're using the same 
super hat chassis and a flowing their first console radio this is just the top of it it goes all the way down to the ground it's a very very beautiful set um it has the first woofer and tweeter to my knowledge ever produced uh, so this thing about roofers and tweeters being something that saw in the 60s or something, you know, that's long before that. This, this, this roofer horn went clear from the top to the bottom of this cabinet, and then the tweeter was inside. And this little knob right here turned the roof antenna down in the bottom. So it was a really innovative set, but it was expensive and so not too many. Of them. Now, the era of 1925 to 1927, we're seeing two major changes, the use of AC power and the production of the horn speaker, of the cone speaker for, for home use. Now you see the, the ads often have these very formal pictures of formal people in their formal living rooms. And lo and behold, there's a RCA speaker and a radio right in the living room. So they're really getting into this uh, fancy stuff more. Uh, the, the, the radio at 20 was a TRF set, uh, average price set. Uh, radio at 24, the first portable set, this, this uh, antenna went in the case. And you could carry it to the uh, picnic with you and then set to open the door and set the antenna on top and off you go. Uh, super hat using the super hat circuitry. And this is a very innovative set. It, it's portable. This set here, this on top is a portable. Take it to a picnic with you. Had miniature batteries, a loop antenna that you could rotate, and then the first known case that I'm aware of of a docking station is this radio. It's set on top of this box. You just set it on there. It made all the connections to the bigger batteries that you want to use to set at home. And if you had a long wire antenna attached to this, it was inductively coupled to this antenna. So you could get more stations. So this is a very innovative set. Uh, the radio 25 is a later version with a rotating antenna on the top, and there's a kit to convert it to AC. Uh, radio 28, very similar. It had some legs to stand on the ground. And lo and behold, the last battery radio of the radio 16. And that's probably use it up most of my time. So I guess if I have any time left, uh, Matt, Matt will probably let you know <laughs> whether we have any questions at the moment or not. One minute. Oh, one minute. Wow. Okay. Four questions. Yeah, you did great. <laughs> you did yeah. great, Charlie. Hey, Charlie, these radios, uh, are all these radios yours so yes, the yes. one that you showed yes. that you're looking for? Yeah, I started a beautiful collection. collecting like 30 years ago, and I've managed to acquire about 600 radios at this time. Uh, but yeah, all these are, are, are in my collection. That's correct. Okay, beautiful collection. Well, I, have two, I have two pictures I could show of our Radiola 2 for and the batteries that go in them. Can uh, I do that? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, it's, 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 it was a fairly popular radio. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can uh, return to that. Uh, you would have to turn your screen share off. Oh, okay, let me do that. <coughs> question, I, for Char question for Charlie. That Radiola model 812, isn't that a portable model? Uh, no, which? AR812. Yeah, it, it was touted as a portable, 
it had a it had a handle like that. You might have noticed in the picture, mine didn't have the handle because they all rotted away. But they weighed about 40 pounds. So in, in today's thinking, it wasn't very portable. <laughs> but it I was think I have, Char Charlie, I think I have one. Uh, they're, Eight one two. they're pretty popular. I mean, they're pretty easy to find. It's not a, there were so many made. They're, they're, you can find them on the market for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Or that sometimes. Okay. Well, uh, I have a radio too, and a lot of other advanced collectors, uh, really like having the radiola twos, but I had never seen original batteries in the radiola twos. And uh, I haven't, this is my radio, but those are not original batteries. I spent an unreasonable amount of time in researching to make museum grade replicas uh, <laughs> using, there is the, the first versions of the Everetti 22 uh, and a half volt battery and uh, the Everetti tungsten uh, four and a half volt batteries. And then there are the Burgess equivalents to it. But, yeah, that, that, that looks real good. I do have one too that has batteries in it. I'm not sure they're original, but uh, they look similar to what you're look, I'm looking at right now. Well, I'd like to uh, like to see a photo of the of the batteries that you do have in them. Uh, let me point. take a look and see what I can find. In, uh... Yeah, maybe you can post it on uh, the list, sir. Okay, I'll see what I can find. All right, I'm going to unshare. Yeah, Charlie and Charlie and Bob, this is Tom. Uh, if you guys want to send me the picture after the fact, I can just blast it out to everybody, and uh, you guys can share it that way. Okay, um, it's kind of a non-IT guy, okay. but we'll figure it out somehow. <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you, Charlie, very much for uh, such a fine presentation and, uh, and, and covering all those uh, radiolas. That's a very impressive collection, indeed. And all right, thank you. And I think I tried to put, much, put too much into the talk because I really had to abbreviate the history, but... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. in, in, in the Radiola book, by the way, there's 20 pages about the KVKA history. So there's yeah. a lot to read if, if someone's interested. Yeah, well, I, I learned a lot just uh, watching your presentation. So thank you very much for that. And, uh, thank you. Well, one, more, one more question here, Charlie. Um, tell me again, this is going to be a great trivia question. Um, what Radiola model was it that you said was your, your first uh, uh, instance of, of a docking station where that- uh, uh, That's the 25, I believe, if I- Radio remember. 25. Uh, the, the uh, radio was a 28, I'm sorry. Uh, but in any case, the radio had a seven, six or seven pin plug. And that, that box on the bottom had a protruding matching mail plug. So when you set it on, it automatically connected the bigger batteries in the battery box. So that was the, the, the 28, the radio at 28. I believe, it's a, I believe it's a 28. Very good, uh, thanks. No, it's the radio at 26 that has the that has the base or the battery box. Um, 26. You're right. Yes. You're 26. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, um, we're uh, running pretty close to schedule here. So um, what I'd like to do is, is move on to the last presentation. And if you have more questions for, for Charlie or any of the other presenters, just save them for the, the very end when we have the open session. So um, so I'd like to now hand the, uh, the floor over to Tom Kleinschmidt, who's gonna talk about cabinet preservation. All right, here we go. Um, so this is gonna be multi-part. So you're gonna be uh, seeing me in a multiple sessions, depending on how Tom and Matt schedule me. Um, let me uh, that's what happens when you bump the, uh, the mouse. Um, 
In any case, uh, we're going to, uh, this is probably going to be a two or three part deal when we get done. And I wanted to narrow it down. So I just picked a plastic radio that I just bought recently. And uh, so let's get rolling. So here's kind of the, uh, the way I'm taking a look at this thing. Um, first off, uh, just let me say that there's a million ways to do a lot of things. This is a way that I do it. I'm not claiming it's the best in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you've got other ways to do it, I think that'd be fine to chat about in the open session. Um, if you think I'm doing something that's absolutely dastardly, then I guess you need to let me know. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was this is a detailed approach for the first time radio person. So this isn't for people that have been doing this since they were 12. This is for somebody that just bought a radio and, and has no idea where to start from. So let's call it uh, Radio Cleaning 101. And in fact, we're gonna do no cleaning today. We're gonna get prepped to clean the radio. So here is our victim. This is a FADA model 153. Uh, and I bought it because it had that kind of quasi uh, New York State uh, uh, World's Fair kind of look to it there in the, in the grill cloth. Um, this radio is quite dirty, as you can see in the picture. Uh, and they made it in brown, they made it in ivory. They also made a version with a remote speaker you could put by your ears so you wouldn't annoy people so much. Uh, but uh, we'll get rolling here. So here's the basic seven steps to doing a radio. Again, it's gonna vary, we're gonna change things. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on taking the radio apart and stabilizing the labels. So step one, obviously, is to pull the knobs off. For those not familiar, some knobs have a set screw in the side of them. Some of them are pushed on. Sometimes the pushed on ones can be really ornery because the little spring inside the knob will rust to the shaft. So it's going to take a little creativity. In the case of this one, they pulled right off, and it wasn't a big problem. Uh, some of this I was going to do live, but I thought it would take too long, and I don't have a camera that's up for the task. So uh, I'm doing this in slides. So obviously there may be some details that may not be clear and please do jump in with questions if that's the case. So second step is to get the chassis out. And, uh, and the caveat here is where this blue arrow is, there used to be a cardboard back on this set and it was held with some little pushpin pins which we'll look at later. And what happened was people would grab the cardboard and pull on it and of course it would tear out of the pushpins and you'd end up with just a torn back. And of course, since these radios needed to be serviced, the back got taken off a lot, the chassis got pulled out a lot. So, you know, things get lost. And that gets me to the next point where there's supposed to be four screws on the bottom here, and there's only two. I've had ones with none, I've had ones with one. I've also normally have them with the wrong screws in them. Sometimes they don't even hold very well. Um, so, so the housekeeping thing here is uh, as we take things apart, we're gonna put them in a container and I'll show you that in a minute too. So here we go, got the two screws out of the bottom. You're gonna notice this capacitor dangling around back here. That was a uh, not so up to spec kind of fix. Most likely there was an electrolytic can over here in this hole. And this thing's just dangling off the back. And of course, since the technician tucked it behind the antenna, who would know, right? So there we are. So then the next step is we got the chassis off to the side. The chassis will deal with another thing. We've had a number of people ask about how to repair five tube radios and other radios. We'll probably get to that in the future. This is about cabinets. So these things all have these little blow molded plastic covers over the dial. I don't know exactly what the right word is. It will call it a window for the purpose here. Uh, they do turn yellow with age. They were perfectly clear when they were new. Back in the day, in the, you know, probably in the 90s, there was a couple of people that were making these things reproduction for various radios. The good news on this one is twofold. One is it's not cracked. It doesn't have a big scratch or anything in it. I mean, it is a little discolored. Uh, or, and, uh, and it wasn't held in very tight. It just popped right out. So that was this step. So we put that out to the side. Next step was the speaker grill. And yes, I violated the radio and wrote top on the top here with a Sharpie. If you're worried about that kind of stuff, use some blue masking tape. The reason I did that is because this thing is symmetrical on all four mounting holes. I can put it in four ways. And it's faded and gotten dirty and so on to match 
the grill on the front of the cabinet. So I want to put it back in the same way, even though I'm probably going to make an attempt to clean it somewhat. But then you're dealing with cardboard. Uh, the comment that was made earlier, you know, that radio companies are out to make a thing for a price. So the blow molded plastic is all cheapo. The cardboard is cheap. This piece of fabric is not exactly going to be something you're going to put on your furniture. And they're held in with these little push pins. And the key tool you have that you own that we're going to use a couple of times in this presentation is your fingernail. Fingernails are wonderful things. Uh, and you can pop these out with your fingernail. It takes a little bit of work and it's going to hurt a little bit sometimes. But if you try and get any kind of a tool underneath there, you're likely going to damage the cardboard. Now you can take a pocket knife and come in sideways and gently rock it back and forth. I've done that and it's been successful. But in this case, fingernail technology did the trick. So then the other thing is the handle's bolted on on this guy. And it's like, you might ask, why are you gonna bother to take the handle off? It all has to do with making it easier to clean because the whole cleaning thing is what we're getting ready for. And some of the things we're gonna to use to clean will damage paper, will damage fabric, or will scoot underneath things and, and stay there forever. And so it comes down to making it easy to get things clean and easy to put them back together. So in this case, uh, you'll need a stubby screwdriver because you want to come in square, but these came right out. Uh, then it's a chance to look at the handle to make sure it's not cracked because sometimes they crack from the pressure of the, of the uh, screw pulling on them. All right, so here's what we've got. This is what we've pulled out in the little tray here are the knobs, the screws, the push pins, the handle, and the other two parts are a little bigger, so I got them off to the side. And you can see, if you remember what the grill cloth looked like, here's the, the angular piece and here's that circle and here's dirt, no extra charge for that. And as you can see, it's really not high end cloth. It wasn't sewn on the edge or anything. So you gotta you know, handle with care. We'll see if we can do anything with that. We may just live with it the way it is. So now we're gonna stabilize the labels. Now I, I'm showing you this picture to show you the relative location. There's two labels on the bottom. This one's the tube layout. This one's the patent and model number label. Uh, often these labels are inside the cabinet you know, and often they're on the bottom of the cabinet. And in this case, they're on the bottom. And uh, so here we go. And what I did is if you take the back side of your X-Acto knife or something similar, you can kind of check around the edges and see where it's loose. I am not removing the label. I'm just trying to figure out where it's loose. So as soon as I found one loose spot, then the next step was to do some gluing. Um, there's multiple glues you can use. I, I happen to use contact cement. The uh, Disclaimer here is some plastics may react to the solvents that are in the contact cement or something else. So if you're concerned about it, inside the cabin underneath the chassis, put a little dabble duty on there and let it sit for a bit and see if it gets soft. If it gets soft, don't use that, that, uh, that glue. Now on wood cabinets, I often use a glue stick. They work really well. You can also use white glue if you want. We aren't doing a wood cabinet today, so we'll get to that another time. So I did crease the label slightly just to, so it would stay up. Got some glue underneath it. And the next step is to do some squeegeeing. Now this is for a, a repair on the right side. So I started in the middle and pulled towards the outside very, 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 and about 12 more very gently. If you push hard, you'll tear the paper. So this thing was loose almost all the way around. It happened to be stuck well in the middle, but it wasn't stuck well on the edges. And then what happens is you get some squeeze out. And of course, once it gets a little tacky, you can take your finger and rub it back and forth on the squeeze out and, and, and remove it. So on this label, it was really tight except for a couple of little bubbles that you can see here and here and here. And of course this bubble and these two little guys here, we're leaving those because no matter what we do, we're gonna make it worse. But this is so the edge doesn't get caught and start to start to peel up. And as I commented here, you know, what we consider a defect today, they didn't consider a defect back then. That wasn't a defect. So that's phase one. Tried to be quick because I knew I was coming up in the end here. Any questions? That's great, Tom. 
Um, well, I have I have one uh, statement there is that when you're working with labels, at least my practice is take pictures first and before you have the opportunity to trash your labels uh, by gluing or whatever. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, as I've gotten older, taking pictures of things. Uh, Tom, any uh, suggestions when the knobs refuse to come off? Um, what you have to do is get, if you take, depending on how much room you've got, if you, you get something that's kind of fork shaped, you know, a pair of long nose pliers it comes to mind and get it onto the shaft and then gently pull and rock a little bit. Because the thing is, it's really easy to wreck the knob. As we all know, we've all wrecked knobs. Um, if it's if it's solid to the to the front of the set, that's when it gets really interesting. I've had some success loosening the chassis and pulling on the chassis and using the cabinet as you know a support on the back of the knob if the cabinet's robust enough to do that, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing I've run into, which screwed me up on one radio, is I had a set that had three push-on, uh, four knobs. Three of them were push-on and one was a screw-on. And, and the screw-on one I did last, and I just thought it was another push-on knob. And I, actually broke the knob. And uh, so you got to look at all the radios because over time things may have been repaired with a knob that looks identical, but it's a screw on instead of a push on. And that messes you up. One quick thing, on, as far as the knobs go, uh, take yourself a latex glove, wrap it around underneath the knob to where you get it on the shaft. And then you can sit there and work it a lot easier than, you know, putting pressure on other things. The latex, the latex glove always works for me on that. Excellent. Never didn't know about that. Uh, uh, Tom, what did you do about any scuffs or scratches on the uh, plastic cabinet? How did you that, remove them? That's coming next time. <laughs> next that's time, gonna, okay. That's, that's going to make sure you tune in <laughs> next time, Bob. Yeah, okay. gotta stay tuned. <laughs> it's a okay. good thing. <laughs> yeah, the whole cleaning, scuffing, polishing, fixing all that stuff's coming up. I, I, so the uh, dishwasher doesn't do it? <laughs> well, the dishwasher <laughs> might be a little rough on like, <laughs> doing the, the labels will be gone. You'll have those scrubbed right off. That won't be a problem. Okay, Tom, well, thank uh, you very much. I have one more question. Uh, one thing you want to make sure you do, if you're going to uh, take a picture of the label, it's a good idea. Make sure you get the same size, measure the size of it also, if, if you can photo uh, uh, shop that and get it down to the exact uh, dimensions. Yeah, good suggestion. If you have a flatbed scanner, sometimes you can put the cabinet on the flatbed scanner too. You can also lay just a little scale alongside of it and you'll have your uh, measurement in a picture when you take the picture. Okay, some great questions, some great suggestions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we all look forward to the next installment in your series of presentations. So uh, with, with that, I think we're gonna call the uh, presentation section of our meeting today completed. So thanks to everyone that participated in uh, doing, being a presenter and I'll welcome everyone out there to be a presenter for, for the next time or some future meeting. So think about that. And uh, we'll move on to the next portion, which is our items for sale, items wanted section. And uh, Tom Clenchman usually handles that, so I'll turn it over to him. <laughs>